Hey, hello. Um, sorry, I'm starting late. There was, there were people using this room until like exactly five twenty, basically. So, um, okay. So, uh, where we are in the book? This this is helpful, right? That I go through where we are in the book. Okay, I'll tell you. I was afraid that it's too repetitive. But... <laughs> right, so there are two parts of the doctrine of elements, the transcendental aesthetic and the transcendental logic. And um, there are two parts of the transcendental logic transcendental analytic, which we're finishing today, and then the transcendental dialectic. And the transcendental analytic has two parts. Analytic with concepts, right? That's where the table of categories was and the transcendental deduction and analytic with principles. The analytic with principles has three parts. Schematism, system of principles, and phenomena and minima. And phenomena and numina have an appendix. It's called the amphiboly of the pure concepts of reflection. Amphiboly basically means ambiguity. Um, um, I mean, it could be used to mean something slightly different, but I don't think Kant means anything special by it beyond ambiguity. Could be wrong, but I don't think he does. <laughs> All right. Um, so there's basically uh, like two completely different ways to approach this section. And I always try to do both, but I usually don't really get to the second one very much. Um, but we'll see what happens. So, I mean, like on the one hand, there's um, what the section is officially about which is the pure concepts of reflection and why somehow they're ambiguous, although it's very confusing. <laughs> um, uh, but unofficially, the section is about Leibniz, <laughs> right? That is, it contains Kant's response to Leibniz's system. It also apparently is supposed to contain this response to Locke, although Locke is only mentioned in passing at one point. But when Locke is mentioned in passing, it sounds like uh, Locke just made the opposite mistake here somehow. So um, so presumably you, and I guess, well, I should say one other thing about it. Locke, first of all, Locke is only mentioned in passing explicitly, but the list of concepts of reflection basically comes out of Locke. Um, so, uh, um, and as I said, when Locke is mentioned, it's implied that somehow, like, there could be a parallel response to Locke. I don't know exactly how to work that out, but it would be good to know how to work that out. <laughs> um, in any case, so I'm not going to try to, to, to do that, um, but uh, I will try to explain the response to Leibniz, and it's a response to Leibniz and a defense of Newton against Leibniz is what's going on, right? So it's primarily, I mean, although Kant has supplied other information about Leibniz and Wolf uh, from other places, but it's primarily a response to the Leibniz-Clark correspondence, I think. Um, okay, um, like I said, I will hope to get to some details of that th 
about that at the end. Um, but I can just for the moment point out one thing, which is that, um, so according to Leibniz, a rational monad. So for people who weren't in 100 B, Leibniz argues that the uh, entire universe is made up of these things called monads. And monads are basically, well, as I tried to show when I when I try to show when I teach 100 B, monads are basically angels. <laughs> um, in, the, in some traditional sense, some traditional Aristotelian sense of angels. Um, but, uh, but you know, monads are like immaterial beings that have a kind of um, representations in them, and they have a kind of uh, something analogous to a will or appetite, right? They, they always try to gain their own next state. And that's basically all they do. They don't interact directly with each other. Um, but some monads are rational monads. For example, we're rational monads, whereas other monads are not. So uh, like every uh, organized body has a dominant monad, but if it's like a plant or something, then it's not a rational monad. Um, so what's different about rational monads? So according to Leibniz, what's different about rational monads in general is self-consciousness or apperception. Right, so a mo rational monad has a perception, it has a consciousness of itself. And Leibniz says um, that uh, it has the right to say I. And then he says that because of that, these monads can come to a knowledge of themselves and of God, right? So as I understand that, what Leibniz is saying is that a rational monad is basically able to go through a version of the argument in Descartes' meditations. I mean, it's going to be a modified version because... Uh, Leibniz's physics and metaphysics are not the same as Descartes, right? So we can't end up at the same place. But I think as far as like the first, second, third meditations, what Leibniz's rational monad does is is, is supposed to be similar to what Descartes does. Um, so, uh, and certainly Wolf, have I mentioned Christian Wolf in this work before? When, uh, when, oh yeah, I'm sure I mentioned in the first lecture, please. Yeah. So when, when Kant is responding to Leibniz, he's obviously often responding to the Leibnizio Wolfian system, as he puts it, right? That Wolf was a follower of Leibniz who wrote these huge, long systematic treatises. And, uh, Wolf's German metaphysics begins with, more or less a version of the initial, the, be, the beginning of the meditations, right? So at least Wolf also thought that Leibniz, you know, would want to incorporate that somehow. Um, so, um, and like I say, like I said, this modified version will not lead to Descartes' metaphysics and physics. But presumably, it will lead to Leibniz's metaphysics and physics if you do it correctly, right? So um, that is, in particular, I guess, it would lead these monads to know all the principles that Kant is refuting in the <laughs> <laughs> Um And so, and I'm I'm going through all this because I think it shows that um, if. If I'm right to say that this section is about reflection, and certainly we know this has something to do with reflection, because it's the concepts of reflection, um, then uh, um, it's not like a coincidence 
that the criticism of Leibniz comes in this section. I mean, Kant makes it sound almost like it's just a coincidence. Like, oh, fortunately it happens that, uh, you know, like the reputation of Leibniz falls out of this, right? But it's actually like reflection and self-consciousness, the apperception are, are like somehow have to be the center of what Leibniz and Kant disagree about. So you should expect it to come up here. Um, Okay, but anyway, that's just about, that's, like I said, if I have time at the end, I'll say more about the reputation of Leibniz in, in detail. But, um, but, uh, oh, this is not clear. Um, um, but for now, I want to, talk about the official story of what this appendix is about. Um, right, so what I said last time is that this whole section is about reflection, and but in particular, it's about the understanding's ability to set a limit to itself by reflection. Um, And that's why it's needed here because, you know, uh, in the in the in the analytic so far, the understanding has um, shown that we have title to this land and nothing else. But it hasn't shown that we have title to that land. Right. So that's what this section is about. Um, um, and, you know, to justify it, it seems like you would have to establish our title to the concept Newman. That's, that's basically the problem. I mean, that's the problem in the main part of Phenomena and Newman. Okay. Right. That's why the, the full title of this section is something like of the division of all objects into phenomena and numata. So, um, right, this is the limit that the understanding draws with this. There's numata everywhere else <laughs> and phenomena in here. Well, I mean, this, it's actually a little bit, but Kant, although he sometimes mentions this, does not like systematically keep, keep discussing it. And I'm not 100% sure why. Um, that, uh, I mean, we're limited not just to phenomena, period, but to phenomena that are objects of our form of sensible intuition. So, um, like in, in this section, Kant mostly talks as if the alternative were our form of sensible intuition or intellectual intuition. Um, but um, he clearly doesn't think that. And, he, some, and, and sometimes he, you know, he'll mention or another form of sensible intuition other than our own. So like in reality, this limit is, you know, narrow. Oh, I guess. Yeah, I don't know what to say. I mean, I think. I think Kant feels that there's no particular temptation to think we know, we know about these alien phenomena. Um, I mean, if he if you told him about non-Euclidean geometry, if you have it now, maybe he would start thinking more about what the temptation is here. <laughs> that's that's all I can say, but. Um, but 
anyway, I mean, we rate like doesn't, there's no equivalent that metaphysicians all talk about as if we knew about new, but there's no equivalent, you know, the people who talk as if we knew about forms of sensibility different than our own. Um, okay, so, uh, so just, just like Pot, having mentioned this, I'm going to stop mentioning it. All right, so this is the limit between phenomena and noumena that we're talking about. And you might think that to draw this limit, you would have to be able to use the concept that's on this side and the concept that's on that side. How else can you draw a distinction between two things? Um, and remember, the answer of the main section to that is that, well, we do have a right to the concept noumenon, but only in a negative sense, not in a positive sense. Um, so this is, I mean, this is why basically we're talking both about reflection, right? Like looking back at our own faculty and seeing how it actually works and comparison, right? It's like the comparison between what we do know and what we can't know. That's what we've been talking about in the main section. Um, So in this appendix to phenomena and noumena, um, um, he makes it clearer what his view about comparison and reflection is. At least that's that's the idea. I mean, one of the things that makes the that makes the amphiboly difficult to understand in my experience is precisely the way in those first few paragraphs, he keeps going back and forth between comparison and reflection and can't figure out which kind of comparison and which kind of reflection and what he's, um, right. But um, that's the idea. So I think, um, I think as far as comparison goes, um, there's basically, well, there's, there's three kinds of comparison, but one of them is not really the same as the others that, I mean, that Kant discusses. So, I mean, the one that's not the same as the others is logical comparison, which he also sometimes calls logical reflection, but then he says logical reflection is mere comparison. <laughs> right. So logical comparison is comparison of concepts. So it's not comparison of their objects. Whereas the other two kinds are comparison of the objects of concepts. <laughs> or the objects of representation, right? So, and although there isn't a place where he clearly says these are the two kinds of objective comparison, I think this is uh, the way it works out if you try to understand what's going on in this section. There's transcendental comparison and there's empirical comparison. Right, those are two different ways um, of comparing representations with respect to their object. Right, like comparing their objective reality rather than just their formal reality. Um, and as usual, the transcendental kind. Um, it is still kind of logical in the sense that, that it's, it's a matter of transcendental logic, not formal logic. It's still logical in the sense that um, yeah, I mean, maybe I should have put it actually this way. These are both ways of comparing objects. 
but this one is a way of comparing objects um, based just on what is it that enables us to give objective reality to a representation and nothing else. Um, right, so as usual, transcendental logic is where we abstract from everything particular about how our representations have an object and just think about how they have an object at all. <laughs> um, and now we're gonna be trying to compare the ways different representations do that. Um, and um, so the empirical kind presupposes the transcendental kind in the sense that you have to be able to compare objects in general before you can then start comparing specific pairs of objects. Um, so, uh, and the empirical kind uh, is possible, or that is, it must be possible. I mean, why must it be possible? Well, basically, like, uh, I mean, Pop says, and I'm going to try to explain that, or, well, Pop says this is the point where it becomes confusing. Pop says that before we make any judgment, we must be able to, to compare its objects. Um, what kind of comparison is that? So I think it's, it's primarily this empirical comparison. We must be able to carry out empirical comparison. So like, for example, we have to be able to uh, compare all cinnabar with all other cinnabar to see that they're identical. That's the first concept of reflection is identity, right? Because without being able, if we couldn't do that, we couldn't use cinnabar to make a universal judgment, like all cinnabar is red, right? First, we have to be able to uh, represent all cinnabar as identical in some sense before we can apply a single predicate to it. So, um, so, and since if you go back to what we said in the analytic of concepts, you know, like for the, the judgments to be possible, the categories, I mean, well, okay. We know what the categories are because the categories are what, what make the different kinds of judgments possible. Um, and we know the categories are applicable. So we know the different kinds of judgments are possible. So we know that we can do this kind of comparison. But if we can do this kind of comparison, we must be able to do this kind of comparison because this presupposes that. Um, um, and although this kind is not obviously a kind of reflection, Right, when I compare cinnabar with cinnabar, that's not reflecting on the nature of my own faculties. This kind pretty much is reflection. Right, like I'm comparing objects with respect to how they get objective reality at all. And that's a question not about the objects, but it's, it's prior to the objects, right? Like, Again, that's what I think transcendental means. It's it's before or beyond being or objective, right? So uh, so this this question is not a question so much about the objects as it is a, a question about my own faculty of representation. Um And I think like um, this kind of transcendental comparison, which now we see is also automatically a kind of reflection. Um, well, let me say one more thing. So each one of these kinds of comparison 
also establishes something like places. Is that off the board? No, it's, I mean, not this one. Yeah. Um, this is another thing about the section. Maybe this is another way you can go through it. Besides the official story and the Leibniz story, this is actually the place where Kant treats space in this book, right? Like, I mean, that is, there was a discussion of space in the transcendental analytic. Uh, but this is the this is the place where Kant talks about the fundamental properties of space and how they allow us to represent objects. Right, because in the um, so far we've been talking about the form of inner sense that is time, right? So like the in particular the schemata of the categories are all properties of time, not space. But all of a sudden we get to this section, which is the appendix to a weird unexpected third part of the thing, <laughs> and all of a sudden buried in here, first of all, is this new list of fundamental concepts, the concepts of reflection. And number two, uh, you know, not announced anywhere, but if you read through it, it's clear that this is where he discusses why space is also involved in representing objects. Um, and so like that somehow has to do with the fact that comparison, at least in a metaphorical sense, consists of dividing something into the different places something i'll say it in a minute what but something into the different places in which you could classify them. so in the case of empirical comparison and this is why space is going to come in here in case the case of empirical comparison it's going to turn out that the relevant places are literally places <laughs> In, a, in the case of logical comparison, Kant says every concept is, every different concept is a different logical place. Yeah. Um, like two objects that are kind of like a piece of pressure, being in the same place, being like, being like a, something to grow and change. Wouldn't that be the same place? Like, it would be compared to itself. Um, okay, that's a good question. Um, so I think, uh, I never thought of it but from that point of view. But I think the answer is that identity and difference are established by being in two places or one place at the same time. So like, um, so the first pair of concepts of reflection the ones that correspond to quantity. Um, like if you could, if you have two things at different times, you can't tell if they're the same thing or a different thing. Right? To tell if they're the same thing or a different thing, you have to see them at the same time and see if they're in different places. This is this is very similar to, and I think not coincidentally, very similar to what Locke says about identity and difference in the essay. Right, that identity is always um, a relationship between things at different times. And the way we know that uh, this one is the same as this one is, you know, that is by comparing this one to other things at the same time. And we know these can't be the same. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, when you, I mean, all the categories, including quantity, are going to bring time in somehow. 
because we know that the schemata of the characters are temporal. Um, but uh, Yeah, it's pretty clear that the other concept is obstruction. Maybe I should write a list of the concepts of reflection first before showing the concept. Right there. Yes. Um. There are four pairs. Riemann and opposition is the second one. Inner and outer is the third one. And matter and form is the fourth one. So, um, Although I always feel like these should go in the other order. It's dangerous to say that. Anyway, for at least for the for the first three rows, I think, you know, um, this is quality, quantity, relation, and modality. I think Kant makes that perfectly clear. Although I have read not someone, so yeah, I guess that doesn't make anything so clear that someone can't disagree. Because I, I have read an interpretation of Kant that says, yeah, it's true for the first two, but then, it, then it's not true. But Kant says, and so on for the other categories. I, I don't understand how they can, yeah. So anyway, um, and but I think it's also pretty clear that uh, these correspond in my way of writing the categories to the first two columns, right? Like unity, plurality, reality, negation, um, substance, accident, right? Because substance and accident are about the inner conditions versus cause and effect, which are about external conditions. And again, I feel like form should correspond to possibility and matter to actuality, which is why um, it seems like they should be reversed. But maybe, I mean, yeah, it's a little complicated. I think in the case of empirical comparison, maybe it does go this way, and that that's kind of some, something like what Kant, the point Kant is making. <laughs> anyway, there's no third column uh, of the concept of reflection. Um, um, I don't know exactly how to explain why there isn't. Um, I do know that Hegel always supplies a third one. Right, like so in Hegel's logic, I mean, these things don't all come up in exactly the same place, but but they're all there somewhere. And there's always a third one. So like identity, difference, ground is the third one in Hegel because he, because a ground and consequent is a relation of things that have the same content, right? Like the ground has to be necessary and is necessary and sufficient for the consequence consequence. So the ground and the consequent are in a sense the same thing, but they they're different from each other and yet yeah, like reflected back into each other. Um so I guess you know to try to understand why there's no third column in Kant, it would be useful to try to figure out why Kant could say that. You know, but anyway, I don't have anything to say, so I'm just pointing out. Um so um right and what I was going to say is like, so identity and difference for reasons I was I was just discussing seems to be about difference in place at the same time, right? But difference in place, agreement and opposition is turns out to be about difference in direction at the same time. And again, you can kind of see how even like. 
there are two directions in time, but we always only go in one direction. <laughs> so times can't cancel each other out the way spaces can. Right? Um, inner and outer. In this case, it, it seems clear that outer is just what time is missing. Right. And and con like there's some connection between these terms, inner and outer, or internal and external, and, and the terms internal or inner sense and external or outer sense. Right. That his Kant himself seems to make a distinction like that when he explains why Leibniz believes that monads have to be like minds, because he says, well, they Leibniz thinks they have to have absolutely internal determination. And he says, we, what determinations do we know of that are absolutely internal? Only the ones of inner sense. <laughs> right. So, uh, um, so like in time, so to speak, there's only inner, there's no outer. Whereas obviously in space, there's inner and outer. And matter and form is in it's, it's the same place. <laughs> oh. So, um, yeah, so that's the best as I can say. I think, yes, you can compare things at different times. Maybe this is the right way to say it. You could definitely compare things at different times, but the, the, the formal condition that makes comparison possible is space, not time. Um, so, I mean, so, so this is empirical comparison, but what is transcendental comparison? Well, so I, and as I said, logical comparison in, involves like each concept being its own place. So I guess the more specific concepts are in the place marked out by the more general I think is the image. Um, right. This is this is what happens. It's, this is what Kant talks about, especially in. So there's an appendix and there's a remark to the appendix, <laughs> right? And the remark is much longer than the body of the appendix. So it's in the remark that Kant starts talking, especially about places and about topic. Right. So. So topos means place in Greek, right? And the relation between topos and topic is like the relationship between logos and logic. Um, so the way, so Kant uses, just as logic is like about logos or something like that, topic is about places. That's the way Kant uses the term topic here. I mean, it's based on this book by Aristotle called the Topics. Um, but no, no, no two people agree about why Aristotle called it the Topics, <laughs> and therefore they don't necessarily agree about what topic. So, like, as far as Kant is concerned, um, if you call it Topics, that's like saying mathematics, right? It's it's not that mathematics is a there's one mathematic, another mathematic, another mathematic. All of mathematics is the study of gamma or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, so um, right. So, but it, and I'm going to at this length because in English we basically use we like this parallel. And I don't know about ordinary German, but in uh, but as opposed to in Kant's German in English. We, we don't carry out this parallel. We basically use topic to mean place, right? So logical topic, this is ex like, like what's the topic of this book is what Kant is calling the logical place. The logical place of the book is the concept that's like a title for everything that's in the book. Um, so I guess, although Kant doesn't use this Greek word, he uses the German word ort, which is equivalent to it, right? But um, as, you know, as far as Kant is concerned, we shouldn't say what's the topic of this book. We should say what's the topos of this book. 
Okay, interestingly, a lot of people use logic kind of the same way. Right, like if a logos, so one thing logos can mean is arguments. Uh, or reason. So like philosophers usually um, think of logic as the study of arguments or reasons and what makes them valid. But in ordinary English, this feels sloppy to philosophers, but maybe we're the ones who are weird. I don't know. <laughs> but in ordinary English, people will say, well, what's your logic? <laughs> Right, where they're using logic to mean this, not the study of this. All right, anyway, sorry, that's kind of a digression. <laughs> um, right, so that's a logical topic. And on the other hand, or say that's a logical topos. That's what logical topic or topics is about. And then an empirical topos, which empirical topics would be about, or what we, what we call topology, right? would be about the study of literal spaces. <laughs> um, but uh, what about transcendental comparison? What are its places? And I think the answer is there are two places, this place and this place. <laughs> right, so the actual transcendental comparison is, I think, And it's, you know, like I said, especially that first few paragraphs, it's like, it's really hard to get any consistent scheme to work. So I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that this can be fit to everything Cox says, but this seems to be like the best choice. Act, the actual transcendental comparison is always just between this and this, right? So like, for example, Cox says, we compare representations to see to which faculty they are presented, whether to sensibility or to uh, understanding alone or something like that. So that means like we're comparing them to see, I think means we're comparing them to see whether their phenomena are new. And then you might say, well, wait, hold on a second. They're, they're never gonna be new, right? <laughs> But I think that's the right answer, right? That that's why Kant, and that's what Kant has already concluded in the body of phenomena and noumena. And what he makes more explicit here is that when we carry out this transcendental comparison, we are comparing between um, something and a void place, right? As he says, for us, this place is empty. We can't rule out that there could be something in it, but we have no way of representing it. No positive way of representing it. Okay, so for us, this place is empty. So, I mean, it's it's interesting to compare this. So actually, we're not going to read the first antinomy, but the first antinomy, the first part of the first antinomy is about the um, or the second. We have to go time for a few minutes, please. Anyway, whichever. Part of the first antinomy is about the question, does the world have a limit in space? Right? By which he means, um, is it true as, as Locke uh, thinks that there must be some limit to the extent of matter? Could be very far away, we don't know, but some at some point it, matter must stop. And then everything outside of that is, as Locke often says, that you know, that that great inane, <laughs> right? That great emptiness. Um, so it's very much like this picture, only with literal space, right? And so um, whereas here Todd says, yes, that's what we conclude. Here, it's part of an antinomy, right? So there's one argument that says there must be a limit like this, and there's another argument that says there couldn't be. And Kant says, they're both wrong. It's a bad question. We can't represent the world as a whole, right? So what's the difference between transcendental comparison and empirical comparison? That's another question that I'm going to ask, but I don't know how to answer it. <laughs> um, 
Um, but it must be important. I think if you could like if you could say exactly why. In this case, it's good, and in this case, it's bad. It's something, various things would become clear. All right. Anyway, um, um, okay. So, um, and uh, so most importantly, we want to apply these concepts identity and difference across this board, right? And say. Noumena are not phenomena. Phenomena are not new. Um, it's, I mean, it's important to, for that to even make sense to, to remember that phenomena and noumena are types of objects. Right? Again, the title of the section is on the division of all objects into phenomena and noumena. I mean, if we, this isn't a distinction between different kinds of things or beings. Um, uh, there's no contradiction in supposing that the very thing that's the object of my faculty is also object of a different kind of faculty that I don't have. Right? So there's no contradiction in thinking that the same thing is both a phenomenon and a new thing. There's no there's no content we can give that. Right? But like to give that content, we would have to be able to apply these concepts of reflection. Right? But got the chalk here. Uh, this, but but it's one of those things we can think, even though we can't know it, right? We can we can think the objects of our sensibility are also numina. That is, they're also objects of an intellectual intuition. But but nevertheless, these are different kinds of objects, right? These are objects of a sensible intuition, and these are objects of an intellectual intuition. And so we want we want to apply these concepts and say these are different from these. And how are we going to do that? Well, um, um, So these sensible conditions for comparison are missing on one side, right? As Newman are not in space. So like, I mean, I guess this is kind of obvious, but this limit can't actually be a limit in space, <laughs> right? So um, uh, how do we do this comparison? Um, Well, I mean, I think the answer is that we basically do the thing that Leibniz is trying incorrectly to do for Intercom, but it is the right thing to do here. Namely, uh, we fall back on the logical the criteria for logical comparison. So, um, we say the concept of a phenomenon is not the same as a concept of a new one. Right? And that's clear because the way we got the concept of a new one is by abstraction, abstracting from the concept of an object of our faculties. And then um, um, adding the negation of what we just took out. <laughs> so Number one, it's different, that it's conceptually different. And number two, it's conceptually opposed, right? It's, it, I mean, and that's why our concept of noumenon is negative, <laughs> right? This kind of, uh, this, oppos this, this opposition can only be conceptual opposition, that is negation. Um, I'm not sure what to say about the other two categories, <laughs> but so I'll just say what Kant would say, and you can go on with the other two categories, <laughs> right? Um, but you know, um, 
But all those comparisons, you know, like that that form of logical comparison is, you know, yields a comparison between something we have a concept of and not. <laughs> And like, sure enough, so I didn't assign this part. I keep thinking maybe I should, but this reading is so long that I feel like I have to cut it off where I can. But the very end of the amphiboly, I think this is supposed to be, see, there's like three asterisks in the middle of the page. <laughs> I believe that's what it, that those three asterisks are there in the original two editions. I should check that. But anyway, it's some kind of mark like that. I think it's I think it's those same three. They're really three stars or whatever they are. Um, and and then there's this other part. So I think we're erase that table of contents, and I keep trying to point to it. But I think we're still in the amphibole at this point. But it's this the new part is called usually people refer to it as the table of nothing, <laughs> right? That Kant, um, lists the four types of nothing corresponding to the four categories. And without going through the whole thing, I'll just point out that the, uh, the first kind of nothing, empty concept without an object, or ens rationis. Kant explains it this way. To the concept of all, many, and one, there is opposed the concept which cancels everything, that is, none. Thus, the object of a concept to which no assignable intuition whatsoever corresponds is equal to nothing. That is, it is a concept without an object, ens rationis, like noumena, which cannot be reckoned among the possibilities, although they must not for that reason to be declared to be also impossible, right? So the, uh, the noumenon is a type of nothing. <laughs> it's a specific type of nothing. It's the type of nothing where you have a concept, but you have no way of giving it an object. Um, so that's why you can do that conceptual comparison that I was just talking about. Um, but that's all you can do. Um, well, actually, so I've already talked about a lot of the stuff here. Okay. Um, are there questions before I go on? Okay. Um, so I guess like one of the hardest things to understand in that initial part Back to that. Um, right. An examination. Or investigation maybe you could translate that word but anyway th sorry this is on b316 on page 276 in kemp smith and in, an examination that is the direction of our attention to the grounds of the truth of a judgment is not indeed required in every case i think i actually read this a long time ago when i was talking about how kant doesn't think that the principles of mathematics need to be proved Anyway, is not indeed required in every case, for if the judgment is immediately certain, 
for instance, the judgment that between two points there can only be one straight line, there can be no better evidence of its truth than the judgment itself. Okay, so, so far so good. If a judgment is immediately certain, um, you don't have to, before carrying out the judgment, investigate what the grounds of its truth are. But then he says, all judgments, however, and indeed all comparisons require reflection, that is distinction of the cognitive faculty to which the given concepts belong. Um, so it sounds like, it sounds like that means before you make the judgment, all cinnabar is red, you have to carry out some transcendental philosophy, <laughs> right? And like determine what faculty, the concept cinnabar and red belong or something like that, which is implausible, right? Um, uh, But I, what I think he means is something um, um, is something like this. So, um, an intellectual representation um, is a principle for unifying something manifold. Um, and uh, therefore, it rests on the possibility of comparison. So, um, Why why does judgment come in here rather than just concepts? I think he says also here that even just to have the concepts, we need to carry out the comparisons. Is that it? Or am I hallucinating that? Maybe he doesn't say that. This is an instance of the general thing about like that is for example why we start with the table of judgments rather than the table of concepts and whatever. But um, um but it works out here. I mean you can understand it by talking about forms of judgments. Um and therefore the corresponding categories. Right? So like if you have a judgment like cinnabar is red, so this is the subject concepts. And this is the predicate concept. And the judgment is possible because um, uh, the subject concept cinnabar can represent its object in the right way to allow the attachment of the predicate. And actually it can represent its object in many ways, which, which correspond to the many ways that the predicate can be attached. Right, and that, that's the metaphysical deduction. So, but if you just think about the category of quantity, so, you know, as, as I already said, for, um, so on the one hand, the category of unity or the first moment of quantity is what allows universal judgments. Um, Right, the cinnabar represents the concept cinnabar when it represents its object as all one. That's what allows us to apply a predicate to it universally. But how can it do that? Well, that requires the use of this type of comparison, right? That is to represent its object as all one, it has to, um, because again, its object is manifold. Right? That's the whole point of an intellectual representation. It's, it, it, it's, its object or its object is represented as manifold, and it has to find a way to unify. So that's why the concept of, it ha we have to be able to apply the concept of 
identity in order to make it possible to to use the category of unity and therefore to make universal judgments. And similarly, on the other hand, if this is a, a particular judgment, right, like um, some cin cinnabar is shiny. Um, well, now cinnabar has to represent its object as different from itself. Right, because that's how, otherwise there would be no difference between sum and all. <laughs> right, the special force of sum is that the object is not all the same as itself. And we're not claiming that it's all shiny, only that some of it is, right? So, um, I mean, it's it could all be shiny and the judgment would be true. But, you, but, but, in order, but even to make the judgment with sum instead of all, you have to represent it as all different from itself, such that it could be sum and not all. Does that make sense? In one <laughs> right. So, um, and to do that, of course, we need this concept. Right? We need to represent it as self different. How does Hegel say that ground is what comes with the singular? Ground thinks we don't need another way of comparing, comparing to get the singular judgment, like this cinnabar weighs five grams, right? It's it's enough that the like we take all the parts of the cinnabar as different from each other, but then we like regard them as relatively unified. Oh, that's what allows the predicate to be relatively identified. That's what allows the predicate to be applied. And of course, as you can see by what I'm doing with my hands, it's because of the properties of space that we can do that, <laughs> right? Oh. This cinnabar always means the cinnabar in this place at a certain time. <laughs> um, okay. Um, and to be able to use these concepts, we have to know where to use them. <laughs> That's the transcendental reflection. So, I mean, I, like, it has to be, you can't explain it otherwise, right? It has to be that we're able to make a judgment like all cinnabar is red without knowing anything about Kant's transcendental ideas, right? So without knowing about the difference between phenomena and noumena and whatever, we can make that judgment. But I think, um, it's again, it's, you know, it's like what he said about the things he proved in the analytic of principles. We would use them <laughs> empirically, even without this proof. Um, we know where our, uh, the objects of our concepts are going to be compared with each other, namely in space. Um, but, um, uh, what we can't do is when someone tries to break free of that and compare them with something that's not in space, like a monad or God or whatever, we don't know how to uh, explain that that's illegitimate because we haven't carried out this reflection. Um, so, um, so even though it doesn't exactly fit what Kant says here, as I, as I promised to begin with, all judgments, however, and indeed all comparisons require reflection. That is distinction of the cognitive faculty. I mean, you have to say that, the, that not all judgments don't require that explicitly. <laughs> you have to know where you're doing. But yeah, so... Um, 
Um, or I'm completely misunderstanding what the whole section is about. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> right. So um, and um, um After understanding where the comparison must take place, then we're able to understand how the comparison can take place, right? Because then we're able to point to the properties of space that make this kind of comparison possible. Um, Okay, I'm going to get to talk about that. All right. Um, because in previous years, I spent a lot of time dithering about the details of these sentences here at the beginning of the amphiboly, and I don't think that's useful. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, But what I do want to talk about is, and this leads into talking about Leibniz. Um, so uh, if we don't carry out this transcendental reflection or don't carry it out properly, then we're going to end up with some kind of error. And the error is Leibniz's error, although, again, it seems like it should probably be Locke's error as well. Right, it's just that Locke takes it in the other direction somehow. Um, but we have the details of it as Leibniz's error. Um, I think, I mean, I guess I didn't get a chance to say this last time. In the main body of the of the section, right, in phenomena and noumena. Just the title of the section. In the title, in the in the main body of the section, phenomena and numina, Pratt does discuss something which he calls an illusion that's difficult to free ourselves from. I think the illusion there is the illusion, the illusion that um, if we can distinguish between phenomena and numina, that must mean we do know something about them. Right. Um, so, um, and the answer to that is the negative concept of the numina. Now, like in the appendix, the amphiboly, um, like he's definitely still discussing the mechanics of like the basis for for that answer. At least that's what I was just claiming when I drew that picture or whatever. But um, but meanwhile, a new type of mistake shows up, a new type of illusion, I guess you could say. So, I mean, one question is, the transcendental dialectic is the logic of illusion. We're still in the analytic. Is this the same illusion that we're gonna be talking about in the dialectic? Is it a different illusion? If it's a different illusion, shouldn't it be in the dialectic? <laughs> the dialectic, Kant says that he's gonna list all the forms of transcendental illusion. So there shouldn't be another transcendental illusion. So um, I'm not sure, but I think that the illusions discussed here are not the transcendental illusion that we're going to discuss in the dialect. And I think they're different from it because the, the, the transcendental illusion that's going to be discussed in the dialectic is a natural illusion. It's like an optical illusion. 
He, he, he compares it to an optical illusion, right? So, you know, an optical illusion, like even once you know it's an illusion, you still can't stop seeing it, right? It doesn't help to know that it's an illusion. Well, it helps, right? Like it prevents you from banging into something or whatever, right? Like that knowledge is useful, but what it can't do is make the illusion go away. You still see it. So um, I think that, I think that what we're talking about here is like an artificial philosophical illusion. That's not, that doesn't naturally evolve. Right, so like when you le read Leibniz's system, If you're not a Leibnizio Wolfian to begin with, you're 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 not going to be like, oh, that must be true. You're going to be like, what? <laughs> and so, if Kant says, well, this is why Leibniz thought that that it's based on mistake, you're going to say, oh, okay, well, good. I'm not going to think that, right? So it's not very much like the transcendental illusion is supposed to be, right? I mean, just think about the example I was just talking about. Yeah. Either the world has a limit in space or it doesn't. It seems like one of those has got to be true, right? They're contradictory opposites. How could it? But nevertheless, Kant is going to say that's a bad question. And that it's, it's a transcendental illusion that makes us think that one of those must be true. Um, all right. So, therefore, this error is not exactly the same as the error in the transcendental dialectic. Um, the error is, it has to do with thinking that the concepts of reflection have a transcendental use or employment. I think Tim Smith translates employment, although Gebrauch, which is the term Kant uses, is just the regular word for use. So you could just translate it transcendental use. But anyway, so we think these have a transcendental use, whereas they actually, what they do have is a transcendental meaning. I think this is the exact same thing that Kant thinks about the categories as well. And he says that in this section about the categories as well. And it makes sense if there's this kind of correspondence between these concepts and the categories. So um, they have a transcendental meaning. That is, um, uh, they, um, there's nothing in the concepts themselves that refer to our form of sensibility. Um, right, so it's that same picture I keep drawing of the category and its schema. And the category is kind of like indefinitely extended, right? Any kind of object of um, discursive intellection would have to fall under the category. But we only know one, there's only one example that we know is that so much as possible. And that's the one that's actual, namely our example. <laughs> right? So that's what it means to say that the category has a transcendental meaning. Right? It doesn't mean the category of unity or the category of quantity doesn't just mean number. Unlike the situation with the concept dog, right? Like here's the concept dog and its schematism or schema. The concept dog and its schema. The concept dog means exactly the content of the schema. But the, but the concept quantity doesn't mean exactly the content of its schema, which is number. Um, it, um, it just means that somehow, um, some one is the same as many together without saying how that's possible. So we know it's possible because you can count and measure out the parts of something, right? And that's, that's the scheme. 
but the category itself doesn't describe it. So because the category has a transcendental meaning, it's tempting to think that it also must have a transcendental employment. That is, that you must be able to use it to um, refer to objects in general. But that's not actually right. And that's, um, Right, so like Kant says, um, this is on B3345 on page 294. Um, talking about Leibniz's error. The error, which quite obviously is the cause of this mistaken venture, and which indeed excuses, though it does not justify it. Right? So throughout this, his tone is that Leibniz is a great philosopher. And, you know, he made this mistake, but this mistake is very understandable. And, uh, and I think more than that, I guess you could say that it's a sign that he's a great philosopher that he made this mistake. <laughs> Um, like he really he got to the real key point, but then he went the wrong way or something. So anyway, um, uh, the error lies in employing the understanding contrary to its vocation transcendentally and in making objects, that is, possible intuitions conform to concepts, not concepts to possible intuitions on which alone their objective validity rests. So what is what does that last part mean? I think um, um, and I think this is the same thing he means on b three thirty five when he says that this error leads to and I think Kemp Smith corrected this actually. Page 288. Oh, I see how he corrected. Right. So, um, so you'll see here um, in the text, it says, um, but if I apply these concepts, that is the concepts of reflection, to an object in general in the transcendental sense, without determining whether it be an object of sensible or of intellectual intuition, limitations are at once revealed in the very notion of this object. And, and then what it says here is, which forbid any non-empirical employment of the concepts. But what it actually says in the original, and that's what it says in this footnote here, is which pervert any empirical employment of the, of the concepts where pervert means like turn backwards. Right, like to use something in a perverted way is to use it backwards. That's I think the same thing he's saying there where, where, in the other place where he says that, um, the, that Leibniz is trying to make, to, to force intuitions to fit concepts rather than the other way around. What happens is, um, the right place to start with this. So, why this is irrational? Not doesn't use that term here, but he uses that classification of discussing the difference between 
Le Leibniz and Locke. Leibniz is a rationalist. Leibniz thinks that um, if uh, I can know an object, it must be able to make it the object of my intellect alone. So, um, um, So we have objects of the intellect alone, and we're able to form concepts of them, according to Leibniz. So if we're able to form concepts of them, we must be able to compare them. That's what we've just been discussing. So we must be able to compare objects of the intellect alone. And then, well, how are we going to do that? Well, I mean, it's similar to what I said. This is what we actually do in transcendental reflection. Going off of my board. No, I'm not. Okay. I mean, not the end of the board, the end of the screen. Yeah. Um, right. Remember, I said, like, how can we say that these are different? The sensible conditions for comparison are, are missing over here. So I said, well, we just compare the concepts. So Leibniz thinks that uh, like all we have is numerous. <laughs> and we have to be able to compare them to each other, not just the phenomena. How can we do that? And so the answer is we must be able to compare them the same the way we compare concepts. That's the only way that the intellect by itself can compare things, the way it compares concepts. So that's how, I mean, this is part of why the section is so confusing. That's what logical comparison comes back in here. We're talking about um, Leibniz getting confused between phenomena and noumena, that is doing transcendental reflection wrong. But because he does it wrong, he um, thinks that empirical comparison must be reducible to logical comparison. Right? He thinks that the way we, we compare all the objects of our knowledge must be the way we, the way we compare concepts. And so this is kind of like, um, and that's the sense in which he's trying to make intuitions fit concepts rather than concepts fit intuitions, right? So he's saying, look, uh, this is what we have to start with. Here's how you can compare concepts. Um, it must be possible to, con to compare all the objects of our knowledge then. So our intuitions of them must uh, be, have the same properties as concepts. Oh. And then, so this, it's kind of like a perverse transcendental deduction, basically. Like, because of that, Leibniz uh, ends up with these principles. Ray, just as Kant, by doing it the right way, ended up with a list of, of basically of four principles corresponding to the four categories. Leibniz, by doing it the wrong way, ends up with a list of four wrong principles. <laughs> These are the things that must be true of the objects of intellection if um, uh, they can be compared the way concepts are compared. Right, and so we get um, so, for example, here we get identity of indiscernible. Right, one of Leibniz's most famous principles. This says that if things are um, have all the same internal determinations, that is absolute non-relative determinations, then they're the same thing. 
Well, I mean, as Todd says, this is that's true of concepts, right? Like if I say, you know, here's the concept cinema, and it's like lead, it's heavy, and hot. And here's the concept, you know, Quinnabon. And it's also red, heavy, and toxic. Um, these are the same concepts. Because I can't say, like, so the, let's say these concepts could occur in different external relations. Right, like I use this one to judge that cinnabar is red, but I use this one to judge that quinnabar is heavy. <laughs> so that they appeared in different judgments, but that's not relevant here, right? If they're absolute internal uh, characteristics are the same, then they're the same concepts. How is it that I'm able to use them in two different judgments? Well, you know, it's because I make one judgment at one time, one place, another judgment at another time, another place. Um, that is ultimately those external relations I'm bringing in here are time and space, but the time and space are not relevant to comparing the concepts, right? So um, Leibniz concludes the same thing must be true of the objects of our concepts. And that's the identity of indiscernibles. Hmm. And uh, so there's one for each of these, right? This one says that realities do not cancel each other. Um, right, because again, so first of all, you have to remember what con thinks a contradiction in a concept amounts to, right? He says, if there's a contradiction in the concept, the concept is nothing. That's actually another thing on the table of nothing. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the one corresponding to modality. Um, so uh, if there's a contradiction in the concept, the concept is nothing. Right, so he's thinking of the concept, right? So if Quinnabar has not read, so like we might say something, B meaning what, post Quidians or something like that, might say something like, well, this is a perfectly good concept. It just has empty extension. It's still a concept. Uh, but, uh, uh, But Kant thinks of this as failing to be a concept, right? The introduction of the, of the contradiction has destroyed the concepts, so to speak. And that, there's no way to do that with, without adding not red, that without adding the negation of something that was already in the concept. Right? There's nothing like the way you can have a moving force accelerating a body in one direction. And then you can add a moving force accelerating in the other direction. And they destroy each other. <laughs> they cancel each other out. And so there's no acceleration, right? There's nothing, there's, there's no way to do that with concepts. And so again, Leibniz says, well, the same thing must really be true of the objects of our concepts. Um, so, uh, uh, so for example, as the, Kant, the example Kant discusses, which is an important dis example, all evil must be limitation, right? It must be lack of good. It can't be positive evil. Um, you know, 
I go through the rest of these? Um, you know, this is, Um, you know, I'll just write something here like the child characteristics come first. Right? Again, if you go back to the same kind this thing I was discussing with Cinnabar and Quinnabar, you could see that like you can't start making two different concepts by putting them in different external relations. First, you have to assign their internal characteristics, and then you can ask what their what external relationship is. So again, Leibniz says that must be true of the objects um, of our uh, uh, representations, and that means that. Uh, um, properties like position, um, size, and even at least as Kant and Leibniz understand this shape are um, um, can't define types of things because they're merely relative. I mean, yeah. I think we're discussing what sense they think shape is really relative, but I'm, since there's only two minutes left, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and yeah, this one is supposed to be the matter comes before form. But what the implication of this is supposed to be for Leibniz, though. Um, I guess you could say spatial relationships supervene on something else. Um, right, the monads are primarily related to each other by clarity and unclarity of, of representation of each other. And then it's only based on that that you can um, understand what we mean by saying that things are closer to each other in space or whatever. Um, uh, I don't have time to explain that. And in fact, uh, yeah, I'm out of time. I was hoping to say something about the defense of Newton, but I don't have time for that. So I'll see you next week and we'll talk about the transcendental dialectic. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Those are here. <laughs>